together, any place where two bones join. And so that we, we commonly refer to those as joints, but the official word for them in medicine is articulation. So let's talk about some of those terms that are there on page 95. See if we can kind of make some sense out of those. You see a bunch of them uh, that are that are kind of defined for you already. So we have the, the word arthro, which means joint. The word osteo means bone. Chondro means cartilage. Um, and arthro is a, is a kind of a dedicated term that we're going to see a lot in this chapter. Whew, we're going to see arthro in a lot of stuff. <laughs> so arthro means joint, any place where two bones come together. And... Um, it, it, most people are familiar with the arthro, the word arthro when we talk about arthritis. So if you, I mean, from the time I was a little kid, my grandmother had arthritis. And so she would just talk about the arthritis that she had and suffered in her fingers and her wrists. And, um, you know, it's just a word that I think a lot of people are familiar with. So it's, it's good to kind of go, oh, wait, arthro, I do know. And the itis on the end of it has to do with inflammation, I-T. I-S is inflammation. So arthroitis, arthritis means inflammation of the joints. So um, some of the terms that involve uh, putting pieces together or something like that, you get these prefixes like sin or sem, which means the bones are together in the, the there's still two different bone making up the joint, but the bones are kind of fully together. So that's where we get a word like uh, at the page at the bottom of page 95, we get a word like senarthrosis. So there's that word arthro, well, arthro, that's the joint, and sen means together. So it's a joint where the bones are together, but it's better defined by using the words immovable joint. Okay, so it's kind of classified by the amount of movement. Then we get the word amphi, which means slight. So if we put that down here in front of arthro, we get a what we call a slightly movable joint, right? And dia, dia is a prefix that means through. Dia is a prefix that means through or complete, all the way through, all the way through. So dia means complete or all the way full range of motion fully movable joint okay so that's how these words can be used to combine into uh the words that we use for arthrosis for for joints arthroses so if you take a look at now this is from the textbook but if you take a look in your lecture notes again towards the bottom of 95 you'll see that we have two different ways of classifying joints. It says classification of joints. Joints can be classified in two ways. They can be classified functionally, okay? So you see functional classification. And I've actually just kind of summarized those three words, senarthrosis, and then at the top of page 96, amphiarthrosis and diarthrosis. That describes, that term describes the amount of movement. So we're talking about how the bones function together. Is there any movement? Then it's a synarth... Uh, uh, then it, I mean, is there no movement? Then it's a synarthrosis. If there's a little bit of movement, it's called, a, it's called an amphiarthrosis. And if there's a good bit of movement, if there's a, if there's a, if it's a freely moving joint, called a diarthrosis. But we're still talking about it related to the amount of, of movement of the joint. Second way of classifying them is kind of at the top there of 96 still, called a structural classification, which is what we describe more as a, um, the the material between the bones. So remember, we're still looking at just any place two separate bones come together.
between the bones, what's holding the two bones together, okay? So I wanted to kind of go over that because if you look at this in the textbook, you'll see tables like these. And these tables have both the functional category right here. So this first, this first table is all the synarthrosis joints, which means no movement. All right, synarthrosis. And the structural category, which describes the, the material between the bone and the one bone and the other bone. Okay, and that's kind of how uh, we're gonna describe them as we as we go along, and and sort of mix. We're gonna skip around a little bit on page ninety six. I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we're gonna look first at the group that are called synarthrosis joints, where there is basically no movement between the bones. There's essentially no movement between the bones. But there's a bunch of different structural types of those synarthroses. And the major ones that you need to know are basically listed here on this table. And in fact, I think, no, no, there, there's, there's not a, like, I was just looking to see if there was a, a, a narrowed down version of it, but... I, I think the synostosis is probably the one, the main one that we don't want you to really know too much about. I've not usually seen that one too much on tests, but so <clears throat> synarthrosis, an immovable joint, can be found in the skeleton with either fibrous connective tissue between the bones or cartilage between the bones. So. When we talk about the material between the bones, we're talking about its structural classification, recall. So in the skull, for example, we have sutures. That suture is where um, uh, two bones come together and there is a little bit of fibrous connecting, connective tissue interlocking the bones, a dense fibrous connective tissue holding them together. And that forms an immovable joint called a suture. And then there's one other example that's important to know, and it's this one that's called a gomphosis, just one of the weirdest words that ever comes out of my mouth every semester when I teach this. I'm like, gomphosis, I said that. That's a weird word, gomphosis. This one is one that we sometimes call the peg in socket joint. So it's like it involves, you know, like a like a cylindrical peg, a conical peg sticking down into a similar shaped socket. So the, the roots of your tooth form a joint with the jaw, either with the mandible or the maxilla. And a periodontal ligament holds the tooth in the socket. But that ligament is fibrous connective tissue. So it's an immovable joint. It's not made to move. I know it will wiggle a little bit sometimes, especially if you bop your jaw on something and it kind of loosens up, but it can tighten back up again. It's not made to move. And so it wiggles a little bit, but it's really not an, a movable joint. So it's a synarthrosis that is also a fibrous joint. Okay, so suture, synarthrosis that's fibrous, and a gomphosis, synarthrosis, that is also fibrous. Okay. So one other immovable, <clears throat> excuse me, immovable, immovable joint that I think is important to know, easy for me to say, right, is a synarthrosis that has cartilage between the joints. So where your ribs connect to the sternum, the rib itself, the bone of the rib itself is actually not connected to the sternum. It's connected to a piece of hyaline cartilage. That piece of hyaline cartilage then is connected to the sternum. So we can kind of say there's a bone and a bone with cartilage in between. All right. So sin means it's immovable. It's kind of an immovable and chondro because it's got chondro in the middle. It's got cartilage in between. Right? 
And that's why it's helpful to look at the word chondro and remind ourselves that the word chondro means cartilage because this one literally has cartilage in the middle and in the name too. It's got the word chondro in the middle of its name as well. So I don't know if that's a, a great way to, uh, to memorize it. It helps a little bit. Uh, uh, Jensen, go ahead. You have a question. So you said S-Y-N means Are you immovable. asking, am I having trouble hearing you? No, no. My, my question is, you said S-Y-N means immovable, correct? Are you talking and I'm not hearing you? Is, is, can everybody else hear Jensen talking and I can't hear you? Yes, you can hear her and I can't hear. Okay, I'm sorry, Jensen. Try again. I said, you said S-Y-N means <laughs> <Type> immovable. <laughs> Your question might be too long to type. You guys can still hear me, obviously. You can hear me. And I can hear, you type into the chat, I can hear the little ping sound. But I just can't hear Jensen talking. Let me try to refresh mine. I'll try to be a good example to you guys and do what I always tell you to do. All right, so Jensen. Send, yeah, send means no movement. That's right, yeah. Let's see right back here. Sin means the bones are fully together. So sin arthrosis means a joint that's immovable, non-moving. All right, hold on. I'm going to refresh my browser to see if I can see if I because I, I just I'll need to be able to hear you guys when you ask your questions. Hold on. done it can you hear me can can you guys hear can you just type a quick yes in the chat all right okay that's good now jensen would you mind asking again i know that you got the question answered but no i'm just confused okay because in the book and like you showed it says that s y n mm -hmm. means together but you keep saying immovable Yes, it means the bones are stuck rigidly together. They are stuck so together that they're immovable. Oh, okay. Okay, I see now. Thank yeah. you. I mean, the, lots of these Greek prefixes, the, the Greeks had lots of meanings, lots of different meanings for some of these prefixes. So, um, you know, I, I go back to this one. I... Yeah, that's what gives the thoracic cavity some, I mean, a little, it, that's not totally off topic, Tanya. Uh, but let me get back to that in just a second. Uh, it, it isn't really, what gives it flexibility is the fact that it's not solid bone, but rather individual pieces of bone called ribs. That's, that's the little bit of flexibility you get from the thoracic cavity. Um, but I mean, this is kind of one of my favorite sort of bizarre examples. The word dia is a, as a prefix that you're going to see a lot. Okay. So diaphragm, the, the gross example is the word diarrhea and the word, the word rhea is a word for flow. And so you can see that in its original meaning, the word dia, as they put it together, for diarrhea was that they meant to describe a condition called flow through that it looked like when you would drink something then it would come out the other end and it felt like it was just flowing through um, that was long before we knew what it was I know that's a gross example but in the example of a diarthrosis where we're talking about a completely movable joint a better interpretation of the prefix dia is the other idea of something going all the way through or complete, like something going all the way through something, you know, and that's kind of where we even use the word diaphragm because the word diaphragm 
is a muscle that things go through. Um, so there's, there's, you know, it, it can be confusing uh, if you try to, you know, understand these people that we don't know from hundreds of years ago and what they were trying to mean when they named these anatomy things. But I will tell you one of the things that's frustrating for me too is that those people that named these things were people that had had intense in-depth study of both Latin and Greek for their entire lives. And I've, I've always kind of rolled my eyes that our basic education system does not include those languages that are so fundamental to the English language. We just try to shove English down everybody's throats without realizing that so much of our day-to-day -day language comes from those ancient languages. Then students get to studying healthcare. And if you guys had had a couple of years of Latin in high school and a little bit of Greek in high school, like, like all those people who named these things in the past, you would, you would really find this class to be so much easier. Like the a huge challenge is just learning the words and making any sense out of all of these jumbled letters. So, you know, that's frustrating for me as a teacher because, because I see your frustration. Um, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be somebody that, that who, who was advised to take Latin when I was in college. My, my, uh, pre-med advisor said, you know, one of the most valuable things that you could ever do is take Latin. And I had to have two years of a foreign language. And he said that would count. So I took it and I took a year of Greek as well. Even though I was a biology major, uh, I had to have the language and it just has been so, so invaluable to me. Uh, but just, I really wish that you guys had had it because all the people that named these things, you know, 100, 200, 300 years ago that named these body parts, they named them words that everybody else in the room would know what they meant because everybody else had the language. And sometimes it feels like I have to teach Latin and Greek. Um, so let's take a look at this next one. Um, uh, Tanya, did I, do you feel like I kind of touched on your question that the idea of the thoracic cage flexibility mostly comes from the fact that it's composed of a cage rather than a solid cylinder of bone, like a solid cylinder of bone would definitely protect your heart and lungs better, but it would not be able to expand when you breathe in and uh, it wouldn't give you any flexibility at all. So I would, I wouldn't go so far as to say that you really get much flexibility from those cartilages at all. Probably not much at all. It just is the fact that they are, um, if you, if you picture, um, a bucket like this, a little, like a little paint pail, and it's got a little bucket handle like that, the way that you lift the bucket handle is very much the way that your ribs move when you breathe. So it kind of, the individual bucket handle or paint handle is not individually flexible, but at its joint locations, it can move up and down a little bit. So there is some flexibility, but it's really all of them together. So let's, let's take a look at our next category. Our next category are slightly movable joints, um, amphiarthrosis. Um, and again, to avoid any frustration, you guys don't, don't worry about this, but the amphi on the front of this is a Greek word that means slight or a little bit, but it can also mean dual or double. So you might be most familiar with amphi on the front of a word like amphibian. And you know that the amphibian animals are frogs and uh, they're not reptiles, but frogs and salamanders. And the word amphibia or bio, amphibio means dual life. So the prefix amphi in Greek can mean partial, slight, or dual. <laughs> so add more confusion. <clears throat> I am really sorry on behalf of all those people that named these things. A little bit more movement than a synarthrosis, but still much stronger than a full freely movable joint. And again, just like before, we have a couple of 
amphiarthrosis joints, one that has fibrous connective tissue between the bones and one that has cartilage between the bones. The fibrous connective tissue uh, joint is one that we would find uh, between like the tibia and fibula of your uh, lower leg. We can find a little bit of these in a few other places, but that's the main one. And this is called a syndesmosis, a syndesmosis. And I will say this, do you remember the three kinds of connections between cells? Do you remember the three types of cell to cell junctions? Tight junctions, desmosomes and gap junctions. You see anything familiar there in the one that Tanya typed? See that right there anywhere? Yeah, yeah. Remember that desmosomes are not as tight as tight junctions. They allow a little bit more flexibility. So that's where the syndesmosis gets its name. It is a tight connection, but it does allow some, some flexibility. The place where the syndesmosis really shines is when you take a step. Now, what would be right here is a thing that I'm going to have trouble drawing for you, but I'm going to try to draw. There's your big toe. <laughs> this is your foot, and these are your five little toes. Here's your little pinky toe. All right, so it's like they're pointing right at you. And when you walk and put your weight onto your foot, this syndesmosis between your uh, tibia and fibula allow a little bit of flexibility to kind of spread and distribute the weight so that it doesn't get fully smashed down onto the, uh, the talk talus and the calcaneus. So it's a good joint that gives some flexibility for that. And then that, so that's the fibrous, there's fiber connecting the, the two bones. And then the other one is called a cartilaginous joint, a cartilaginous joint. And again, because it's a slightly movable amphiarthrosis that is held together by a piece of cartilage. Now, in this case, it's a piece of fibrocartilage that's called the symphysis, or we sometimes call it the pubic symphysis, the pubic symphysis. And that is made of fibrocartilage, and it allows a good bit of flexibility, especially when we are... I, I don't know what this wee business is, especially when women are pregnant. <laughs> there's, there's nothing we men can do uh, to carry that burden uh, except try to give some sympathy and understanding, uh, bring cold ice chips when we are commanded to um, stop as many points along the road as we can for places to go pee. But for women uh, that are pregnant, the, this joint in particular actually gets looser during pregnancy and that can be very painful and it's loosening up to open up the birth canal. So um, that joint becomes a little more flexible during pregnancy than it is other times. Last type of joint is the fully movable joint or what we sometimes call the freely movable joint, the diarthrosis. Um, and this one has really only one structural category, which, which is the one we, uh, word that we used a little bit um, last week where we talked about synovial. And it's got the word ova, which is the Greek word for egg, in the middle of it. And syn, which typically means together. So the, the root word means held together by an egg which is sort of weird. The reason why somebody picked this for its name is because the fluid inside the joint is slippery like an egg white. And so I, again, I think I talked about this a little bit last week. If you've ever dropped an, a raw egg on the floor and then tried to just pick it up with your hands, it is just very, very slippery. Fluid in the space between the bones of a synovial joint is not the same material, but it is very, very slippery and it provides a lot of uh, lubrication for them. So this is really the main one we're going to, we're going to talk mostly about. These are always diarthrotic joints 
and they contain this what's known as synovial fluid between the joints. So if you haven't quite filled in all of your notes yet, near the top, just above the midway point on page 96, there's that little blank there that says synovial joints. These are always diarthrotic joints. Okay, and right above that word diarthrotic, I would write freely movable freely movable, just to give yourself a reminder of what this always means, and contain synovial fluid. So that's this word right here, synovial fluid between the articulating bones. Okay. And it feels like this. You know, I don't know if you guys can see me in the screen, but man, like I told you, my grandmother and her arthritis, so every day... <laughs> Uh, I don't think about it every day, but man, most days when I enjoy smooth, pain-free movement of my fingers and wrists and any of my joints, when I think about it, I throw one up there for grandma and I say, I love you. I'm sorry that you had to suffer. I know it was rough, uh, but I'm also thankful for my my smooth synovial joints. So let's kind of talk about the structure of those synovial joints. Down at, at kind of the rest of the page is just sort of another description of the way that we have been talking about the joints. So there's like um, A, synarthrotic and amphiarthrotic under this big heading articulations. Synarthrotic and amphiarthrotic functional classification. Two, Classif uh, the two classifications and the, the specific joints you need to know. So I kind of talked you through those. For the synarthrotic, you need to know suture, gomphosis, and synchondrosis. Okay. And then there is a cartilaginous, or, or uh, then I said for the amphiarthrotic, there was the symphysis pubis pubic symphysis, and syndesmosis. I'm just checking to make sure I talked through them. But under B, you can also look at them uh, as far as like their structural classification. So you can look, let me go back to my two, my previous slide. You know, the fibrous synarthrosis, suture and gomphosis is similar to the fibrous syndesmosis, but the syndesmosis has the it's got that word desmosome so it's a little more flexible so it's an amphiarthrosis in far in terms of movement now as it says there at the bottom for this class all other joints are fully movable diarthrotic joints and that describes the function and then structural category is called synovial joints okay so this is kind of oh yeah Oh, that was that slide. I already talked through that. There we go. Synovial joints. So I want to draw one with you if you'll kind of do this. If you haven't done it already at the top of page 97. So we'll look back at that slide again in a second. But I want to kind of draw one together so we get the idea of this structure. So we're going to have... I like to use lots of multicolor. Like even if I'm drawing structures on a piece of paper for my own notes, I like to using lots of different pencil colors or marker colors. So we have a bone. And we're going to have another bone. This would be like the joints between your fingers. I'm going to exaggerate the space between the two. It's usually not quite this big between the two. And then we're going to have covering the surface of each bone is a thin layer of what tissue? What is that? While I draw, you guys can answer my questions in the chat if you want. For those of you that are not also drawing along with me, what covers the surface of each bone? It's called an articular cartilage, but what kind of tissue is an articular cartilage? I just kind of gave uh, a huge clue. It's a cartilage. What kind of cartilage? Yeah, hyaline. Hyaline cartilage. 
highland cartilage. Dense, hard, glassy, smooth. The word highland comes from a Greek word that means glassy. It's so glassy. But it's nice and smooth on its surface, almost glassy-like. If you ever see it, if you ever get a chance to scrub in on a surgery, especially if an orthopedic surgeon is doing a, some, some joint surgery or something, um, and you get a good chance to look at the hyaline, as long as the hyaline cartilage on a bone is healthy, it's, it's this bright, very shiny, very, very smooth surface on the end of a bone. So again, you know, I wiggle my fingers and say, you know, I'm glad I give my gratitude for uh, my smooth, smooth fingers. I'm going to enjoy them while I got them so that I can say someday if I inherit my grandmother's uh, arthritis, I can say, Granny, I enjoyed it while I had it. <laughs> Not a day that goes by. All right. So we said already that there is fluid in between these bones and what holds the fluid in is this thing and it goes all the way around actually that's referred to as the joint capsule the joint capsule and it contains the synovial fluid I'll just try to represent the synovial fluid with yellow it's not really yellow but it's kind of, it reminds it reminds me that it's very egg like Okay. So this synovial fluid is contained inside of it. And the synovial fluid, I don't know if this will show up very well, but kind of stick with my color coding. That's the synovial fluid. And it is secreted by the cells, the chondrocytes that make the cartilage secrete material in the synovial fluid. And it contains some of the same chemicals found in cartilage. So the synovial fluid will contain some um, hyaluronic acid. Oops. Hyaluronic acid, which is the main material that gives hyaline cartilage its density. It was named after hyaline cartilage. Um, and the hyaline, hyaluronic acid is in there. The synovial fluid is probably mostly water, but it also contains some materials from like the plasma of these blood vessels that are just on the inside of the synovial cavity as well, which is kind of a layer of cells just along the inside of the fibrous. The purple part is more the fibrous part of the capsule, and this red part is more of a cellular part. And it really acts a lot like the cellular layer on the inside of the periosteum. And in fact, this capsule blends right in with the periosteum. And so there's the fibrous part of the capsule here that is a dense, irregular connective tissue, much like the periosteum, and like the fibrous layer of the periosteum. And then there's a cellular layer under it that's infused with capillaries. It's got blood vessels. And so fluid will leak out of the capillaries a little and contribute to this synovial fluid. And uh, all of these chemicals like hyaluronic acid, and then there's other ones with fun names like glycose aminoglycans, which is a fun name. It's fun to be called gags. Um, not a, not a name you want on the playground in elementary school, but that's a good name. Uh, and these, these are proteins that are very, very slippery. And again, if you've ever held egg white in your hand, you, you have a good idea of what this synovial fluid feels like. So that's kind of what your diagram at the top of the page might look like um, if you were kind of doing it the way I was doing it. Um, and here's how it looks and much more professionally done uh, by the uh, artists of your textbook. So we have the, the fibrous capsule, which I mentioned already is that kind of dense, irregular connective tissue. The synovial membrane, which is more of that cellular membrane. Let me see if I can find a good thing to label. So the synovial membrane is the 
why aren't you writing? It's this membrane right on the inside there. The fibrous capsule is right out on the surface. So together, those two layers make up what's referred to as the joint capsule. The joint capsule. It, it's labeled a little differently in the book, but here's that articular cartilage labeled over here. That's your hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage there. And then all in the space in between is the joint cavity containing this synovial fluid. Okay. Uh, proteoglycans. These are the ones I was talking about called gags. I call them gags. I was going to look and see, does she talk about proteoglycan in the video? I don't find it in the lecture notes, the term proteoglycan, but I'm pretty sure she talks about hyaluronic acid. Anybody watched it yet? I know we're, I know we're, it's it's test weekend, so I'm, I'm assuming that I'm thinking not everybody. Jasmine, she does talk about one of those two or both. She mentioned the hyaluronic acid. Okay, all right. I I'm, I probably have more stuff on my slide than you need to know, but definitely the hyaluronic acid. But I do want to mention this too before we move on uh, to talk a little bit about the different types of joints in our skeleton. The hyaluronic acid is composed of chondroitin, sulfate, and um, a gag, oops, a glycosaminoglycan called glucosamine. Whoa, that's terrible. Glucosamine. Um, and these are, these are two supplements that you can buy at the grocery store, or you can buy like a mega container of them. Um, you can buy a me mega container of them at, uh, Sam's club or Costco. But I, I do want to mention, there's not really any evidence that taking these supplements orally actually improve joint health. Um, it is. It, you, there are things you can do to improve your joint, overall joint health, but taking supplements of these chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine, both of which will be completely digested by the enzymes in your stomach and small intestine into amino acids and monosaccharides. Those things are going to be treated like every other food molecule. So they're taking them in a tablet they're usually made from powdered shark cartilage. So they'll take sharks that have been fished for, they'll dry the cartilage, they'll put it in a desiccant, a dehydrating machine that will dehydrate it and then grind it into a powder. And that's what goes into those tablets of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. And a lot of people take those thinking that they can, that that, that is going to improve their joint health. Uh, but it really just, there, there's no evidence that that would happen. And there's every evidence that all of those chemicals are just going to get decimated by the time they get to the acid in your stomach anyway. They will never make it directly to your, um, to your um, synovial fluid. That's because the contents of the synovial fluid are manufactured directly by, so let me kind of repeat, the synovial fluid comes from cells here, synthesized from these cells, and from cells here, synthesized by these cells. No, the fibrous capsule is not made of hyaline cartilage. The articular cartilages are made of hyaline cartilage. Fibrous capsule is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense fibrous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure enough. So let's move on. We also have a, a couple of other uh, friction reducing structures that are mentioned. The bottom of says, page 97. There we go. Um, bursa and tendon sheaths. These are basically kind of a synovial membrane. Um, 
So this is one of the things that's right above that on page 97. Name three places where synovial membranes are found in the body. Um, joint capsules, bursa, and tendon sheaths are, are three good examples. Um, but a bursa is uh, a thing like this. It's kind of a free, free moving, freely moving structure that, that you can see in this diagram over here. It kind of rolls back and forth as you move your shoulder. And it kind of keeps the head of the humerus from rubbing against these tendons that stretch across the top of your um, shoulder. Uh, tendon sheaths sometimes wrap around a tendon, kind of like a little, kind of wrapping around like a hot dog bun. Um, and they completely surround a tendon, especially where the tendon might rub on the bone. But as you probably know, these can get inflamed, and that's often referred to as bursitis. There's one right on the front of the, uh, what was the first one? The, well, it's just, it's the everything we've been talking about. The synovial capsule, bursa, and tendon sheath. Yeah, synovial, well, those are the three places in the body. Synovial capsule, bursa, and tendon sheath. Right there. So there we go. So um, if you get uh, an inflamed, there's a bursa that sits right on the front of your patella. And this is, this is a kind of a nasty example of we whack your knee and that bursa gets inflamed um, and it can stick right out there. It's called prepatellar bursitis is what it's known as. So the term bursitis is a good medical word to make sure that you know because it's an inflammation of the, of the bursa. Um, all right, so all the different movements of these synovial joints. So all the rest of this chapter is all about these freely movable synovial joints. And there are several factors at the top of page 98 that affect the amount of movement or the degree of movement at a joint. And I've got all three of them listed here. Um, the shape of the articular surface, um, the presence and location of ligaments. Remember, talk a little bit about ligaments because li ligaments are a dense regular connective tissue and they usually attach bone to bone. So there's, you can see them all over this diagram over here. Uh, there's a big one labeled right there, a big long one labeled right here. There's the anterior cruciate ligament, the old famous ACL right there. There's the PCL kind of just behind it there. And these are connecting bone to bone. And then there's a few others that are not mentioned here, like the fibular tibial li ligaments, the patellar ligament. And they're just connecting bone to bone. But where they are located and how many of them there are determines the degree of movement for this joint, which is the knee joint. All right? So your most flexible joint in your body, the most freely movable joint in your body, what do you think it is? What's, it isn't the knee, I'll tell you that. What's the most freely movable joint in the body, the body that has the greatest range of motion? Somebody got it. Let's see. Heba, you got it. Shoulder, the shoulder joint. Everything that you can do with a joint, you can do with the shoulder joint. And there are things you can do with the shoulder joint that you can't do with the elbow or the wrist or the knee uh, or even the hip joint. But that range of motion comes at a cost. There are fewer ligaments, the articular surfaces, are not very close together and so that shoulder joint is easily dislocated compared to the other joints of the body. I have personally never dislocated my shoulder joint but I did have a friend growing up who whose shoulder joint regularly came out of the socket um, and so his just wasn't held as quite as tight. The other factor is this one and this is a this is a pretty big one to list as our third. So we can list these. These will be at the top of page 98, one, two, three. But this one is the one that I would consider not only most crucial to the degree of movement of a joint, but absolutely a huge factor in long-term joint and bone health. So there's, there's one really clear principle that has come out of the, the research 
of bone development, and that is that bone strength and joint strength come from muscle strength and muscle tone. So I'm not telling you to go right out and get a gym membership if you don't have one and start bulking up like Conan the Barbarian, but, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever you want to call him, the former governor of California. Still to this day, you guys, kindergarten cop. Best Arnold Schwarzenegger movie ever. I don't care what you say. It, it, you can say, <laughs> you can say Terminator. You can say that all you want. Terminator. I don't care. Kindergarten cop. Where he looks down at that little kid. He talks about having a horrible headache. <laughs> he looks at that little kid. The kid goes, maybe it's a tumor. And he says in that kind of Eastern uh, European accent, it's not a tumor. <laughs> I say that to my kids all the time. They still haven't seen the movie. They still don't know where the quote comes from. But I'm so I'm not saying you got to Schwarzenegger it up, okay? But I am telling you, there's a lot, there's a lot of lies out there for people trying to sell you BS products and all kinds of other stuff to try to have healthy bones and healthy joints. And I'm telling you, the one thing we know from physiology, and I'll tell you how you know this is true. Has anybody ever had a cast? You don't have to answer. If you've ever had a cast, especially on your arm, you know you had to have that cast on for like four to six weeks. And when you took off the cast, the arm was smaller and it was weak because what did your muscles do? What did your muscles do while you had the cast on? What's the word for the muscles getting smaller and weaker? They atrophied. Exactly, they atrophied. But I'll tell you something you don't notice unless, and researchers have done this, a bone scan just after four to six weeks of bone density. And this is a bone you're trying to heal. And the bone density is less in just four to six weeks. You don't just lose muscle. You actually lose bone. And that's the reason why a lot of physical therapists, uh, in just in the last 10 or so years, we've been moving away from hard casts, immobilizing casts, unless absolutely necessary. Because joints and bones can quickly atrophy too, not just the muscles. And we're trying to heal a bone by actually making it weaker. Nope. We need to use more movable soft casts and get the patient into physical therapy as soon as possible. And so I'm telling you, we know this from logic. We know this from common sense about having casts that it's not good for muscles, bones, and joints to have a cast on immobilized for too long. But that comes back to this point that I'm making about the role of muscle in healthy bones and healthy joints, okay? So I'm talking not specifically about working out and bulking up, but I am talking about regular weight-bearing exercise and what is the simplest, easiest, most applicable weight-bearing exercise that you can do every day and we can all do more of it. Doesn't require any equipment. Simplest, easiest weight-bearing exercise that requires no equipment. In fact, your body evolved to do this. Yeah, walking, walking, just walking. It's estimated, uh, ancestor that our ancestors walked about 12 to 13 miles a day 12 13 miles a day and we're trying to get 10,000 steps which is nowhere close to 12 to 13 miles a day we're like oh I'm only like 8,000 steps on my Fitbit our ancestors are looking at us just like I'm looking at you in the camera right now and our ancestors are looking back down on us and they're going you guys are wusses wuss 25,000 steps a day would be about 12 miles. Wow, you calculated that. Did you Google that? <laughs> so we worry about getting our 10,000 steps a day. Multiply that times 2.5. <laughs> times two. Wow, you walk a lot at work, huh? Golly. Woo. Well, good.
good for you, good for your bones, good for your joints. It doesn't feel good at the end of the day, but as the old saying goes, that which does not kill us gives us a headache, terrible headache. <laughs> that, I get, that which does not kill us makes us hungry. Maybe that would be a good way of rephrasing it, right, Tanya? Yeah, you get hungry. Your body is working hard. All right, let's talk about the different kinds of movements that joints can do. And then we'll kind of finish up by looking at specific examples of these joints. Okay, so joint movements, flexion and extension are movements in the, in the sagittal plane. So when you flex and extend, you're moving the body just on the sagittal plane. You're kind of moving on this up, down plane like splitting the body in half left and right. So flexion of the elbow, flexion of the shoulder would mean reaching forward. Reaching forward would be flexion of the shoulder. I don't know if you guys can see me down here in the corner a little bit, but this would be flexion of the shoulder, sticking your arm, kind of pointing it straight out. Okay, that's flexion of the shoulder. Extension of the shoulder would be bending it straight back. Okay. Like my grandmother, when I was sitting in the back seat of the car, and she would extend that shoulder straight back to pinch my thigh when I was, that was her favorite thing. She wasn't much of a spanker. Man, she would pinch. Woo! Hmm. I'm missing my grandma today. I've been talking about her a good bit. So that's flexion and extension. Some of them are easy. Some joints only do flexion and extension. So if you think about your fingers, those joints between your phalanges, flexion, extension, flexion, extension, right? Um, but some joints can also do movement on the frontal plane. So that shoulder I talked about, it can flex forward but it also can kind of reach out to the side. So when you put your arm straight out to your side, you are abducting your shoulders. And then when you bring them back down to your side in anatomical position, that's adduction. Okay. So that would be like, um, like this figure right here, moving, keeping the arms on the frontal plane, kind of keeping the arms on this imaginary blue line, but moving the arms out, like that and like that would be abduction and then moving them back to anatomical position is adduction, A-D-D-duction, okay? Um, with the ankle, you can see we've got specialized versions of both of these movements. So um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are versions of flexion and extension just for the ankle. So if you if you were to point your toes up in the air and, and kind of rock back on your heels like you were walking on your heels with your toes pointing upwards, that would be called dorsiflexion. If you point your toes down, like just standing on your tippy toes, like if you're trying to reach something high, high up, and you stand up on your tiptoes, that's called plantar flexion. Okay, As I call that one tippy toes. That's plantar flexion, okay? So when you point your, point, point your toes down to stand up on your tippy toes is plantar flexion. With the ankle moving inwards or outwards, if you, move your, if you rock your ankle outward on the frontal plane, kind of turn it outward like you're trying to stand on the inside of your foot, that's referred to as eversion. If you rock them inward like you're trying to put the soles of your feet together, like you're trying to make the, like pretend like my hands are my feet. Pretend that my hands are my feet. And if you were to turn them inward like that, that that's called inversion. All right. Uh, circumduction means to draw circles. It, that's literally how the word is translated, to draw circles. So you can do that with your shoulder. You can do that with your shoulder. Kind of stick your arm straight out. And you can draw circles, but when you do that, you're really only drawing circles with your shoulder. Your elbow is a hinge joint. The only thing your elbow can really do is kind of hinge. You can do circles.
circumduction with your wrist. Your wrist can also draw circles. And these joints of your fingers, right there, that joint can also do circumduction. There. But these joints cannot. These joints between your phalanges can actually only hinge. But this first one between the metacarpal and the phalanx, it can flex, extend, but it can also do abduction, adduction, so it can draw circles too. So that's called circumduction. And then rotation is more like it's it's more like twisting around an axis. So that's what you can do with your wrist. Again, if you can see me in the camera view, what you do with your wrist, and it's actually not your wrist that's doing it, it's the radius that's doing that. So you have pronation, supination, pronation, supination. So if you, if you hold your arm out and turn palm up, that's called supination. And if you turn your palm down, it's called pronation. And my anatomy professor in college said the way that you remember the difference is which way do you need to turn your hand to hold a bowl of soup? Supinate. You have to supinate to hold soup. So that was an easy way to remember which was which. Now that me putting my arm out like that, that's not anatomical position either, guys. What's anatomical position? Which one of these, and I've got pictures right over here of three figures in anatomical position, which one of these represents the hand in anatomical position? Is it pronated or supinated? Yeah, it's supinated. Yeah, it's supinated. So the hand with palm forward, as we learned on the first day of class in anatomical position, the hand is supinated, supine. All right, so that's how all of those terms work all right now what you need to do at home this week while you're studying is you go on page 98 and at the top of page 99 and you practice each of these movements with each of these joints so the movements that each joint can do are listed so you can see it says number one wrist wrist can do I'll do wrist for you I already did but I'll do it again here's the wrist Flexion, extension, flexion, extension, and hyperextension is kind of to bend it backwards beyond anatomical position. Technically, extension means to bring it back to anatomical position. All right? Abduction, adduction. So in anatomical position, abduction would be kind of to tilt it out. you got to keep it flat, but tilt it out towards my thumb, and then adduction is bring it back towards my pinky. And then circumduction is really to combine both of those together, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and that's what my wrist can do. So I want you to practice these and then make sure you ask me questions next week. So here are some of the types of, that is also, it's not stuff you ever think, but yeah, no, your hand just moves. And I'm like, cool, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm super thankful that my hand just moves. But in a clinical setting, we got to make sure that we, we can describe the kind of movement that a patient can and cannot do. This is really helpful for especially uh, like orthopedic and reconstructive surgeons or physicians or physical therapists that are able to say, you know, the, the patient was injured, you know, the collie's fracture, they fell onto their hand. And the fracture happened because the, they fell onto their hand while it was hyperextended. So anybody that can describe it using these words is better able to communicate with their colleagues. And that means that we are better able to get the patient or the client the, the help that they, they need. Yeah, but now you know. Yeah. You're like, maybe back then you didn't have any idea what they're talking about, but look, you're leveling up. You're, you're coming up to their level, just learning the terminology. So different kinds of joints 
are kind of listed there in the middle of page 99. I'm just going to kind of go through them very briefly. Um, the ones that the types of movements that occur are listed there and you can classify these. Um, so there's, there's a under big letter C, it says the six types of joints. And then there's a section there that says the joints listed below are synovial diarthrotic joints classify them as gliding pivot hinge ball and socket condyloid or saddle joints so i think y'all correct me if i'm wrong i think that i listed most of those on my slide so i'll show you what i got on my slides and i think this will help you put the pieces together okay so i've got gliding joint okay so the examples of the gliding joints are the intercarpal, intertarsal, so between your carpals and between your tarsals of your wrist and your ankle, acromioclavicle, which is the acromion process of your scapula, and the clavicle, collarbone, and the between the sacrum and the ilium, called the sacroiliac. Now, I've probably got more listed there, but if you look down in this list, they're not in any particular order. But I definitely see intercarpal and intertarsal, and um, I don't see a chromioclavicle. So that's good. These are really the, the ones that you need to know. Okay, so intercarpal and intertarsal are gliding joints, are a type of gliding joint. Does that make sense? It's like a matching game. You know, you could actually just put one in parentheses next to intercarpal and intertarsal because it refers to number one and gliding joint just above on page 99. Is that confusing? No, it's no, no to some of you. Others are kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, <laughs> just trying to make it through the day, just along for the ride. Here's the hinge joint. Why did I skip pivot? Why did I skip pivot? Maybe I've got it. Maybe I've got it. This one's the hinge joint. So this is your number three on your list. All right. So you can find um, elbow, but elbow is going to be listed as distal humerus ulcer, uh, ulna, <laughs> ulcer, distal, it's that very first one, distal humerus ulna is the hinge joint. The knee, which is going to be listed as distal femur tibia. Tibia, that's the hinge part of that movement. Uh, the ankle, which should be listed as distal tibia. <laughs> distal tibia. Um, atlas occipital, mm -hmm. yep, yep, like I said, I don't think I've got them all listed exactly, but the atlas occipital bone, uh, would be considered, yes, would be considered a, uh, hinge joint. I skipped pivot, like I said, I think I'll come back to it, and the interphalangeal joints, the joints between your phalanges and your fingers, so that's not listed down there either rats. Okay. Well, again, if you have a copy of the textbook, you can see I'm, I'm not being original. I'm just kind of stealing from what's in the, what's in the textbook on each of these diagrams in the textbook. There's my pivot joint. This is the number, this is the one that's listed as number two in the lecture notes. And this is the radius and ulna called the radio ulnar but this would also be atlas axis. Atlas axis too. Proximal humerus and scapula. Eh, no, that's ball and socket. Proximal and middle phalanx. Nope. Just, I'm just double checking. Again. All right, the condylar joint, this is one called condyloid. 
condyloid in our lecture notes. Proximal radius ulna. That would be that would be pivot pivot. Did it say that? Yeah, radio ulnar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that one. So the condylar joints, uh, kind of an ellipsoid shape. It sort of looks like a shallow cup with a with a sort of a rounded bone that kind of fits into it. So it allows. Um, flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. So this would be the metacarpal phalan phalangeal joint, the joint between the metacarpals and the phalanx, the phalanges, but that's also not really listed there. We often refer to these as MP joints for short. You can see metacarpophalangeal joints and the tarsophalangeal joints called the M, uh, MP joints down there too. Uh, but those are the ones I was kind of showing you guys before that you can do with your fingers, but you can also do that between the radius and some of your carpals too. So, and then finally, well, I don't really have saddle. I didn't really mention saddle in here, but definitely the most flexible of all the joints. And these are these are the most amazing joints, and they're also easy to remember because they're only found in four places, two shoulders and two hips. You have four ball and socket joints. You have two shoulder joints and two hip joints. So it's actually just a list of two places to remember. And these can do everything. They can do flexion, extension, Abduction, adduction, circumduction, rotation, every type of movement that's, that, that's listed over there on page 98, they can do it. So this would be an example of this. The shoulder joint in your lecture notes is going to be listed as proximal humerus scapula. Proximal humerus scapula. Um, it's also femur pelvis. This one down here is femur pelvis. Okay, so the head of the femur and the pelvis. And I think the only, which, I, which one did I miss? I don't have a slide for the saddle joint. The saddle joint. Did I, did I skip it? I didn't make a slide for it. Which one of those is a saddle joint? Let's see, intertarsal joints, yeah, some of them. Carpometacarpal, some of them, yeah. Yep. Patella and femur, ah. Uh, I don't know. I think, yeah, I would consider the patella to the femur relationship to be more of a number one, the gliding joint. But I would go, I mean, if, if I, yeah, yeah, I'd go with that one. Um, if she talks about a saddle joint in, a, in the video and gives some examples in the video, I'd go with her examples see, distal humor, nope, 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 nope. Uh, proximal middle phalanx, proximal middle phalanx is right there. I'm doing it in the camera. Proximal phalanx to the middle phalanx. And I got one movement, which is hinge. That's all I got. Hinge. Yep. <laughs> Squeaky joint. Uh, all right, so let's look at just a few. Let's see, we've got the knee joint we'll talk about a little bit, the shoulder joint, and the hip joint, and we'll be done for the articulations. I know I got those nasty pictures of dislocations too. So we talked about the knee joint a little bit already. Big, unique thing about the knees, the only joint in 
the entire skeleton that has a meniscus. What is a meniscus? Well, it's fibrocartilage. And you can see them pictured right here. Menisci is plural. So there's a medial meniscus right here and a lateral meniscus right here. They are, they are not part of the, of the uh, articular cartilage. All right. So see if I can highlight this a little bit. The tibia still has a piece of hyaline cartilage and a piece of hyaline cartilage right there. The femur still has its hyaline cartilage. This is an additional piece of fibrocartilage that's mostly for weight bearing. It's weight distribution and weight bearing. Uh, they definitely can get torn. If you're around athletes, you will hear about torn meniscus. Um, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have any blood supply. It's, it, no cartilage has blood supply. That's one of the features of any kind of cartilage. It has no direct blood supply. So that's true of the hyaline cartilage that's on the articular surface. It's true of the fibrocartilage of the meniscus, the fibrocartilage of your intervertebral discs. Uh, no cartilage has blood vessels within the tissue. So what does that mean, guys? You remember what we talked about? What does that mean clinically? What's the clinical consequence of not having blood vessels in the meniscus or in the, yeah, what is the, what, uh, that's the word for it. That's the word for it. A vascular is the word. What is the consequence? Doesn't heal quickly. Does not heal very quickly. That's right. The clinical result or consequence of that is you got a tissue that just does not heal well. Uh, so there are collateral ligaments on either side that stabilize that knee joint. This one's called the lateral collateral ligament or the fibular collateral ligament as it's known in anatomy. But most of the time we refer to it as lateral collateral. And this one over here on the inside of the knee is the medial collateral ligament, sometimes called the tibial collateral ligament. And then the cruciate, are the, that means cross like X shaped. So there's an anterior cruciate and a posterior cruciate that kind of goes behind it. And kind of the importance of these ligaments is that these ligaments are kind of inside the joint capsule. It's really unusual. Ligaments are usually on the outside of the joint capsule. These are really the on, some of the only ligaments found inside the joint capsule, within the joint capsule. So that's kind of a, a, an important significance of those. Uh, their job is to limit, not in a bad way, but just kind of regulate and control the movement of the knee flexion and extension, anterior, posterior movement while you're, while you're running, walking, whatever. The shoulder, the shoulder joint um, is unstable but extremely flexible. There's a couple of ligaments that I think are important to mention. Uh, they the um, ligaments between the clavicle and scapula, you can see those listed. I don't have them on my slide. Uh, but most of these ligaments have names of bone parts that you're probably familiar with. So if I said coracohumeral, which you can't really see here, but it sort of goes from the coracoid process to the front of the humerus, the acromioclavicular would be going from acromium, uh, the acromion to the clavicle around the front over there, acromioclavicular ligament. So uh, these are kind of the, the major ligaments that hold the clavicle in place. Uh, the ones that I've get, got listed are kind of between the coracoid process and the humerus and the scapula and the humerus. It's called the gleno humeral ligament. It's not really, I don't think I've got a good picture of it on this slide, but most of them are just named for the bone that they go to and from. And these help to stabilize the shoulder joint. And these are helped by the muscles. Remember I said the health of a joint and the health of the bones have a lot to do with the health of the muscles that stabilize it. So we've got four muscles that are called rotator cuff muscles that um, I memorized this phrase. This is not the order they're listed 
in your textbook down at the bottom of page 100, but I memorized sits, sits, the sits muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. So now these are parts or regions of the um, scapula, the supraspinous fossa on the back of the scapula, the infraspinous fossa, and then the subscapular fossa. This is where those muscles are. And if you memorize S, I, T, S, these are the muscles that wrap around the head of the humerus and help rotate the humerus, but also stabilize it greatly in that socket. Uh, the hip joint, it's another ball and socket, but it's definitely more limited because the, it, it has the, the bone of the hip joint makes a deeper socket and that our, that articular socket called the acetabulum is a, a much deeper socket for the head of the femur to fit into. But again, three major ligaments, and you can see the parts of the hip bones, the os coxa, the hip bones they're attached to. We've got one that comes from the ilium to the femur, one that comes from the ischium to the femur, and one that comes from the pubis to the femur. And so you can look at these, the iliofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, you can see them kind of from behind. Then around the front, the pubofemoral ligament. These are really the three big ligaments that attach the hip bones to the, the femur and help stabilize it in place. Uh, the major things that limit the movement of the hip joint are those ligaments, as well as the shape of the, of the socket, of the ball and socket, the acetabulum. It's got a deeper shape than the uh, glenoid fossa of the, of the shoulder. Uh, and then finally, a sprain or a strain, as it's known, a sprain or a strain, they're not exactly the same thing. A sprain is usually kind of more of a pulled ligament. The joints, uh, the joint ligaments stretch a little bit, a few collagen fibers torn, but I think the difference with a strain I don't know that a lot of physicians make a big deal out of the difference, but a strain is more of a torn ligament where the ligament is actually severed. So a sprain, the ligament is not completely torn and that should heal itself. So a sprained ankle, very common, can happen anywhere. But a strain is more of a torn ligament that won't heal itself and usually requires some minor reconstructive surgery, uh, hopefully minor. Dislocation is where the surfaces that normally should come together and move together are forced out of place. Um, what's this right here? Anybody know what joint is dislocated in that x-ray right there? What joint is that? No, it looks like an ankle. <laughs> It looks like an ankle. Huh. That's the elbow joint. This is the ulna. So this is the olecranon process of the ulna. This is the coracoid process of the ulna. That's the, uh, the trochlear notch or the trochlear surface. This right here, <laughs> that right there should be right there. It, we got to move that back over there. This is kind of what it looks like from the top side. This is the same elbow but the ulna has been pushed back from where it should be. And you can see it can happen with the phalanges. This is probably a skateboard injury. <laughs> I don't know for sure. It's just an image I found on Google. But this person, this is this person's x-rays. These are their x-rays. And you can see between the proximal phalanx and the middle phalanx, um, these uh, two are dislocated. Yeah, they are, they are disturbing uh, and vomitocious pictures. <laughs> um, yeah, there's much more disgusting and gross things to be seen on YouTube. I will just leave you with that glorious thought. And I will wish you a happy weekend. And I'm sorry for keeping you an extra five minutes, but we...